Amen. I will praise you, O Yahweh, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. Lift up my eyes. I lift up my cry. I lift up my cry. To the hills around Jerusalem, to the God of the earth. I lift up my eyes. I lift up my eyes. I lift up my eyes. I lift up my cry, I lift up my cry, to the hills around Jerusalem, to the God of the earth, I lift up my eyes, I lift up my eyes, who is our helper, the Lord of heaven, yes, he will deliver, the God of all the earth, who will preserve us, the mighty Yahweh say, He will deliver God of all the earth. I lift up my eyes. I lift up my eyes. I lift up my cry. I lift up my cry. To the hills around Jerusalem, to the God of all the earth. I lift up my eyes. I lift up my eyes. Who is our helper, the Lord of heaven? He will deliver the all of the earth. Yeah. Who will preserve us? The mighty God will say, He will deliver the all of the earth. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your I lift up my cry, I lift up my cry, to the hills around Jerusalem, to the God of the earth. I lift up my eyes, I lift up my eyes, who is our helper, the Lord of heaven, he will deliver the all of the earth. Yeah, who will preserve us? The mighty God will say, He will deliver the God of the earth. I lift up my eyes, I lift up my eyes, I lift up my cry, I lift up my eyes. To the hills around Jerusalem, to the God of the earth, I lift up my eyes, I lift up my eyes. I lift up my eyes, 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 I lift up my eyes. Amen. Praise Him. Praise your Father. Come now and let's worship God. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come. Just as you are to worship. Yes, come. 
Blessed you are before Yahweh so come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now.
worship him. is in your hands Oh, I cannot see you, Lord I choose to trust you Even when my heart is torn I will praise you, Lord Even when I feel deserted I will praise you Lord And even when my darkest valley I will praise you Lord When my world Shattered and it seems all hope is gone, yet I will praise you, Lord. I will trust you, Lord, my God. Even in my loneliness, I will trust you, Lord. I will trust you, Lord, my God. Even when I cannot hear you, I will trust you, Lord. I will not forget that you hung on a cross. Oh Lord, you bled and died for me. And if I have to suffer, I know that you've been there. And I know, and I know that, that you're near now. now. And even when is torn. I will praise you, Lord, and even when I feel deserted, I will praise you, Lord, even in my darkest.
one I will praise you Lord even when I feel deserted I will praise you Lord even in my darkest valley I will praise you Lord and when my world And it seems all hope is gone Yet I will praise you,
I'll count it joy that you share your sufferings That your life may flow from me Yes, I will be forever grateful
Amen. It's good to see everybody here. We've got lots to be thankful about around the Miller house. Sleep's not one of those things, but besides that, this Thanksgiving period has been a time that uh, we've been up around the clock. My daughter, Megan Renee, just gave birth to my grandson, who is a Texas boy. And you know that because of the name we gave him. Rowdy. <laughs> Rowdy Joe. And uh, he was, um, and his last name is Delion, the lion. He is, um, he was born seven pounds, seven ounces, 20 inches long, at 4.06 in the morning, Friday morning, and uh, pray there's a uh, little labor in his breathing, and um, they're keeping a watch on him, so just say a prayer. My daughter is doing well, well and uh, my other daughter was finding reasons to sneak to Waco. The, uh, she is, uh, my other daughter, the oldest daughter, is a, uh, a uh, mother hen, so she really enjoys babies and so she's been sneaking up there trying to hold him and she told me this morning I got to hold him all afternoon there was nobody up there Megan was sleeping so I just held him I said oh that's awesome so we just thank the Lord for that addition to our family the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom all who follow his precepts have good understanding to him belongs eternal praise praise Yahweh my soul Yahweh is my Elohim, you're very great, you're clothed with splendor and majesty. Yahweh wraps himself in light as with a garment, and he stretches out the uh, heavens like a tent. Amen. Let's all stand. As we put on our talits. Brother Gerald usually here this morning puts my talit up here, but he wasn't here this morning, and so I forgot to put mine up here. <laughs> I'm not, not used to getting it myself. I'm sorry. I just um, heard just a few minutes ago um, that she's doing well. I didn't know anything about it, and just until just a few minutes ago, I called him to check on him, and uh, his mother had a stent put up her leg. I was going to. We were going to pray at the close of the service, but yes, that's um, she's doing really well. He's doing well, and uh, so it's it's been an exciting <laughs> Thanksgiving period. Amen. Baruch Atah Yahweh Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kedeshanu BaMitzvotav Vitzivanu Al Mitzvot Zitzit Amen. Which means. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us concerning the doctrine of seat seat. Throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments and with a cord of techelet, a unique kind of heavenly blue, on each tassel. You will have these tassels to look at and so you will remember all my commands of Yahweh, that you may obey them and not prostitute yourself by chasing after the lust of your own hearts and eyes. And then you will remember to obey all my commands and will be consecrated to your Elohim. Numbers 15, 38 through 40. Baruch ta Yahweh, Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher kereshanu b'mitzvotav, Vitzivanu lahitatev, Bahasitzit. Amen. Which means, Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments, and commanded us to unwrap ourselves with seat seat. Amen. Amen. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of Yahweh. You may be reseated. I thank the Father for everything that everybody does. When we're not all here, 
things uh, you shuffle around and get things done that's awesome they were all of you are indispensable <laughs> because we need you and as you're here those gifts that you give back marie running and getting the the lamps and and uh, donna getting the lamps done and robert getting the printed page done and so many other things that he does washes my hands make sure there's water in the basin Marie making sure the water's in the basin those are they may sound like little things and Gerald gets here generally an hour early to to make sure all these other things are done making sure it's nice and comfortable in here for you and uh and brings his lovely wife and his lovely wife is so good at what she does and she it's hard to work on, uh, with rabbi on the sound and uh she gets that done uh, and never gripes or complains. The people that work for me here, it's all volunteer labor, they don't gripe and complain. And I'm demanding because I want the best for you. But fa the Father gives these gifts, and these are gifts by the Holy Spirit. You don't just come here and do these things. You, you may think you do, but it's the Holy Spirit that prompts you to do these things. Amen? And in the uh, coming days, I'm going to bring about uh, some backup singers that uh, to back up the backups and uh, so we can have uh, a full voice uh, in our praise team so the father is so good uh, at making these things happen amen amen i will exalt you yahweh for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me yahweh my elohim i called to you for help and you healed me you yahweh brought me up from the realm of the dead you spared me from going down to the abyss Sing the praises of Yahweh, you, his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last only for the night, but joy comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I'll never be shaken. Yahweh, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm, but when you hid your face, I was dismayed. You, to you, Yahweh, I called. To Adonai, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I'm silenced, I said? If I go down to the abyss, will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Yahweh, and be merciful to me. Yahweh, help me. You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Yahweh, my Elohim, I will praise you forever. Amen. Mato. Oh, Thy holy name. 
Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. It'll be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Let us all rise and face Jerusalem. Let us make our profession of faith here, O Israel. Yahweh is the Almighty, Yahweh is one. Shema Israel. Yahweh is our Elohim. Yahweh is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. You shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign upon your hand and let them be frontlets between your eyes. You shall fix them as a mezuzah on the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Remain standing as we pray the Netzarim Amidah. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be reseated. Baruch Ata Yahweh Elohinu Melaka Olam. Asher Natan Lenu et Derek, Ha Yeshua, Bamashiach Yeshua, 
altogether. Blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. Speedily cause the branch of David thy servant to sprout, and let his horn be exalted by thy salvation, because daily do we wait for thy salvation. Altogether, I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah, ever how long it takes, I will await his coming every single day. Baku at Yahweh Hamvarek. Bless Yahweh who is to be praised. Altogether, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh your Elohim. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, so that you may know that I am Yahweh who makes you holy. O Yahweh among the Elohim, who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. there are no deeds like yours your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout the generations Yahweh rules Yahweh has ruled and Yahweh will rule forever and ever Yahweh will give strength to his people and Yahweh will bless his people with peace father of mercy bestow your favor upon Zion rebuild the walls of Yerushalayim for in you alone we trust Elohim and ruler high and exalted, master of all the world.
Yahweh Elohim Zrebaot Yahweh Elohim Zrebaot Hashem Yahweh, Baruch Hashem Yahweh, Amen, 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 Hallelujah, Hallelujah, 
Amen, 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 amen. Yahweh, you are holy and your name is holy and the holy ones praise your name every single day forever. Blessed are you, the holy one of Israel. When the ark would travel, Moses would say, Arise, O Yahweh, and let your enemies be scattered and let them that hate you flee from you. For from Sion will go forth the Torah and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. Blessed is he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people, the commonwealth of Israel. For it is from Sion that the Torah will go forth and the word of Adonai from Jerusalem. Blessed is he who gave the Torah to his people, Israel, in his holiness. Come forward, Donna, daughter of the Torah. You may be reseated. The Torah is at rest. Blessed is Yahweh who is blessed. Blessed is Yahweh who is blessed forever and ever. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who chose us from among all the people and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Yahweh, giver of the Torah. The reading is Numbers 27 verses 18 through 22. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Take Yehoshua, the son of Nun, the man in whom is spirit, and lay your hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And you shall put some of your honor upon him, that all the congregation of the people of Israel may be obedient. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him according to the judgment of the Urim before Yahweh. At his word they shall go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the people of Israel with him, all the congregation. And Moshe did as Yahweh commanded him, and he took Yehoshua and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and implanted eternal life within us. Blessed are you, Yahweh, giver of the Torah. Come forward, Regina, you who consider the prophets. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who chose good prophets and was pleased with their words, which were spoken in truth. Blessed are you, Yahweh, who chooses the Torah, Moses his servant, Israel his people, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. The half Torah portion I will be reading will be Ezekiel 45, 14 through 18. Concerning the ordinance of oil, the bat of oil, you shall offer the tenth part of the bat from the the core, which is a homer of ten vats, for ten vats are a homer, and one lamb from the flock out of two hundred from the well-watered pastures of Israel, for a meal offering and for a burnt offering and for a peace offering, to atone for them, says Adonai Yahweh. All the people of the land shall give this offering for the prince in Israel. And it shall be the prince's part to give burnt offerings, the meal offerings, and the drink offerings, at the feast, the new moons, and the Sabbaths. And all the appointed feasts of the house of Israel, he shall prepare the sin offering, the meal offering, and the burnt offering, and the peace offerings, to atone for the house of Israel. Thus says Adonai Yahweh, In the first month, on the first day of the month, you shall take a young bull without blemish and cleanse the sanctuary. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, rock of all ages, righteous in all generations, the Almighty, the faithful one, who says and does, who speaks and fulfills, for all his words are true and right, for the Torah, for the divine service, 
for the prophets for this Sabbath day which you gave us, Yahweh our Elohim, for holiness, for rest, for honor, for glory. For all this, Yahweh our Elohim, we thank you and bless you. Blessed be your name by the mouth of all the living, continually forever. Blessed are you, Elohim sanctifier of the Sabbath. Come forward, Timothy, faithful disciple of King Messiah, Yeshua. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has given us his only begotten Son as our Redeemer and has given a new covenant to the house of Israel, unifying the two into one kingdom, the commonwealth of Israel. Blessed are you, Yahweh, who chose the original twelve apostles to bring this message of renewal to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and has chosen us to carry that work, to sift Israel from the nation where you scattered them. May this reading stir the heart of all your people. The uh, Hadashah reading, or the New Testament reading, of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 through 17. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering sometimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one, sacrifice for his forever for sins forever sat down on the right hand of Elohim from henceforth expecting expecting till his enemies be made his footstool for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified whereof the Holy Spirit also is witness to us after that he had said before this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days saith Yahweh, I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. For their sins and their lawlessness will I remember no more. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King Universe, for ratifying the new covenant that gives to your people a law of return by the sacrificial blood of your son, King Mashiach Yeshua. We thank you for giving us the full messianic message of the kingdom. We proclaim to all the world the kingdom is at hand. Matthew 3 and 2. For all this, Yahweh our Elohim, we thank you and bless you. Blessed are you, Yahweh, who has renewed covenant with your people, Israel. The ring of Psalms come forward, Brother Ed, and bring to Israel the song of truth. Yahweh Eloheinu Malach HaOlam, who selected people of praise and was pleased with their worship in spirit and truth. You raised up David, your faithful servant, and righteous anointed, the sons of Korah who brought honor to their house, and righteous worshipers in every generation, to sing songs of delight in your presence, and you inhabit their praise. Baruch Yahweh, giver of the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The psalm today is from 100, chapter 115, verses 9 through 15. Israel betach b'yahweh, Ezram u maginam hu. O Israel, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. Bet eharon bet hu b'yahweh, Ezram O Maganam, who, O house of Aaron, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. Yere Yahweh, Behu, Va Yahweh, Ezram, O Maginam, who, you who fear Yahweh, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. Yahweh, 
zeharanu ya verek. Ya verek et bet Israel, ya verek et bet Eharan. Yahweh has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Eharan. Ya verek yere Yahweh. Hakatenim im hage dolim. He will bless those who fear Yahweh, both small and great. Yosef Yahweh alchem alchem ve al benechem. May Yahweh increase you more and more, you and your children. Berachim atem le Yahweh ose shamayim va eretz. May you be blessed of Yahweh who made heaven and earth. May it be your will, Yahweh our Elohim and the Elohim of our ancestors, that you pay heed and mercy to the psalm that I have recited, and may it stand in love, fellowship, and companionship, for we love you and you alone. This is the Torah which, <clears throat> which Moses placed before the children of Israel. Behold, a good doctrine has been given to you. My Torah, Yahweh says, do not forsake it. Altogether, all that Yahweh has said we will do and hear it is a tree of life to those who grasp it and those who support it are blessed. Its ways are the ways of pleasantness and all of its paths are peace. Help us to return to you, Yahweh, when truly we will return to you. Renew our days as in the ancient past. You may be receded. Amen. Many of you were probably amazed as you saw the Hurricane Sandy as it slammed into the East Coast. And you may have heard terms like storm of the century and there's never been a storm like this and et cetera and et cetera. That's just not true. In fact, as Hurricane Go, Hurricane Sandy was a very small storm, a category one barely, 75 mile an hour winds. Well, that's a small hurricane. But what it made it so vicious was the fact that it hit at high tide at a full moon. And that is important. It also hit when a nor'easter was coming down, blasting cold air from Canada. So these things coming through at the same time uh, caused the storm to hit New York. Plus, New York is an artificial canyon of man-made cement and skyscrapers. And so the rain had nowhere else to go but into the homes of the people. And so this was a very devastating storm to a highly populated area. Then I heard the proponents of global warming. And when we hear the term global warming, we mean man-made global warming. And in it we heard, this is the foretaste of coming catastrophe. This is what's going to happen. Next is a worldwide flood. 
caused by the, uh, the ice caps melting and so on and so forth. And that got me to thinking. Well, they're giving an end time message, aren't they? And in fact, we've got people like former Vice President Gore actually preaching in evangelical style about this end of the world. If man doesn't change his ways and start using non-aerosol cans and, and stop driving his Humvees and etc., that this is going to cause another worldwide flood. Well, that's interesting because that's not what the Scripture says, or does it? Can we look and find out what the end times message is? is as Yeshua was sitting on the Mount of Olives the disciples came to him privately tell us they said when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age Matthew 24 and 3 then he says as it was in the days of Noah this what is going to happen at the end is a mystery to which all mankind is seeking the answer. In a world filled with misery and violence, it has never been more relevant than now to get those answers woven into the text of ancient documents passed on through thousands of years of oral history. It's a thread that weaves together the past, the present, and the future. And it's just about to be revealed. As it was in the days of Noah. It's not the worldwide flood you need to be worrying about. It's what was happening in the world in the days of Noah. If you can get a grasp of what I'm talking about, then the whole world could change one person at a time. And this is a supernatural message with physical ramifications. This message holds the key to everlasting peace, true happiness, and real fulfillment. It can even reveal the future. It's all there to be discovered and taken hold of. Once you understand it, then everything in the world that is happening around you makes sense. What is our purpose on the earth? How can we fulfill our destiny? And what does the future hold? For most people, possessing the answers to these questions would radically alter their outlook on life and even their day-to-day -day existence. So can, where can we get the answers? Where do these answers lie? So join me in just a little few minutes. And no, I'm not going to finish today, so don't get your hopes up. And we'll reveal a fascinating mystery. One in which clues can be found in the most diverse places imaginable. Our resources will be sacred scripture, the mountains of Ararat, and scientific theory. Yes, I said scientific theory because I'm not afraid of science. Science be, I better be afraid of our scriptures. I mean... So how can this message change lives? How can going back and looking at the days of Noah be relevant to the 21st century? We're so sophisticated. Well, it was interesting. This morning I woke up and I was watching the Today Show, and you know what it said? That since the world began, we're dumber than we've ever been as a species. How can that bad? We have the iPad. The answer lies in the truth of our message. You may think it doesn't matter what happened on that boat thousands of years ago, but it does. Because if our message is true, then truth will set you free. Set you free from anxiety. Set you free from day to day. Set you free from the future. For instance, 
Does the fact that many scientists and politicians are predicting another worldwide flood tie in to scriptural prophecy? Could a fresh look, a new look at the story of Noah's Ark shed some light on whether this prediction is coming true? Better yet, can it reveal to us if we are truly living in the end of days? I know every generation before us has said they were the last days, but they were ignoring relevant, pertinent scriptures to make that statement. Their agenda was to prop up the rapture lie. But I'm asking you today, is what is going around now and what people are proclaiming now revealing to us that we are living in the end of days? Do we have in scriptures, in the scriptures, a viable roadmap to help us navigate the perilous times of the future? Is there one unifying message that permeates the entire word of Yahweh? And how is that message relevant to us? Yahweh, your righteousness is everlasting and your Torah is the truth, says Psalms 119, 142. 142. In other words, the Torah is the absolute. The spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. So it's the spirit of truth that causes you to look into the Torah that is the truth and teaches you about the Torah that is truth. Couple that with the testimony of Yeshua and suddenly you have revelation power to the Torah and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Says Isaiah 8 and 20. So one of the greatest discoveries that you can make is to realize that the scriptures is a message system. 66 books penned by over 40 authors over thousands of years, yet it is one integrated message system. Every detail, every number, every place and name is there by careful, deliberate, skillful engineering. Did you ever wonder, why do these names, why did they call these people by these names and it seems like they fulfilled what their name was? I've got one word for you, Yahweh. And they named that city, that region, by this name, and they fulfilled that name. Why? Yahweh. Yahweh took the prophet, took the evangelist, took the, prof the apostle, and like a pen in his hand, wrote that unifying message. And if the scriptures were skillfully engineered, is that same force with us on the earth today? In short, is the creator of all the universe still in control? To the believer, the answer is yes. But then there are those situations like the hurricane or tornado or even a wreck that comes and devastates a family. These situations in life shake you to the core of your belief. Where can we find hope in these darkest of hours is there still proof of the creators engineering in the world today well I'm going to tell you that the hurricane and the tornado and the heat wave and the drought are all evidence of the creators design but to find the way we have to find the answers, we've got to go all the way back to the beginning, to the book of Genesis, to one of the most beloved of stories, 
the story of Noah's Ark. Up until the flood, everything was going on as usual. People were marrying, given in marriage. People were eating and drinking, having parties. People were planting, they were harvesting. They were building shelters and cities until. In the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, says Matthew 24, 38. Now the earth was corrupt in Elohim's sight and was full of violence, says Genesis 6 and 11. Part of that reason for the violence was that the women of mankind had laid with angels and there were giants in those days and those fallen angels and those giants were teaching mankind the true meaning of violence even cannibalism so everything was going on as it always had the sun going up the sun going down until Noah received a disturbing message Elohim said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Is there any violence in the earth today? I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth, so make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Genesis 6, 13 and 14. But the flood would not be absolute. Yahweh would save Noah's family. Why? What was so special about Noah? Noah was faithful and he was perfect in his generations, the word says. What it means by that is from Adam down to Noah, that family had kept the faith. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you, Noah, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. Genesis 6, 17 and 18. Do you see now the importance of living the faith in front of your children? Sister Lisa's here because Miriam told her about this place. And she dared to come and taste it and see if it be of Yahweh. And then she passed it on to her daughter. And so on and so on and so on. Amen. But when Noah began building the ark, there was no evidence. There was no evidence there was going to even be any rain. What's rain? What's rain? What's a flood? What's a boat? He had no reference point. He just dared to believe. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and stored away as food for you and for them, says Genesis 6, 19 through 21. Noah did everything just as Elohim commanded him, says Genesis 6, 22. Because he dared not only to believe, but he dared to obey. When everyone around him said, you're crazy. What are you doing? Suddenly you do whatever the voices in your head tell you to do. He dared to obey. This climate change. It's the height of arrogancy to think that you can change the weather. You always said, I'm the master of the storm. The windstorm comes from its chambers and the cold from the driving north winds. Ice is formed by the breath of Elohim and watery expanses are frozen. He saturates clouds with moisture. He scatters its lightning through them. They swirl about, turning around and around at his direction, accomplishing everything he commands them over the surface of the inhabited world. He causes this to happen for punishment? Yes. For his earth? Yes. 
and for his mercy, which are new every morning. Job 37, 9, 13. So you mean to tell me that he sends a drought because of judgment? Yes. You mean he, 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 he'll send storms into a populated area for judgment? Yes. You mean for punishment? Yes. And it rains on the just and the unjust. Because in the believer, it causes him to cry out to Yahweh for peace. And for the unbeliever, it causes him to investigate what in the world is happening. Who's in control? That's why they get angry at politicians. You, you let Hurricane Katrina happen. Let me tell you something. There is no political party on earth that can stop the wind. They go and they posture. They'll send their little aircraft and they'll go to that place and they'll stand there, but they always wait for the storm to pass before they show up. But they can't do anything about the storm. All the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of the heavens were opened and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights just as Yahweh said it would. But Noah was safe in the ark. Everyone else was experiencing the judgment of Yahweh but Noah found grace in the eyes of Yahweh. Genesis 7, 11 through 12 says. All of this is familiar. I know you're sitting here saying, oh man, I've heard this ever since I went to Bible school. Really? Familiar? Yes. But is it fact? Is it fact? Can you prove it? The questions at hand are this. Is there any truth to the story of Noah? What about the spiritual significance to the story? And is Yahweh speaking to the world today through the story of Noah? The important spiritual theme that's woven throughout the story of Noah is the story of redemption. And to have redemption, you must get into Yahweh's vehicle, his ark of safety. But this is a cycle. It goes over and over again in Scripture. People rebel against Yahweh. Yahweh then sends a warning by his prophet, by his apostle, by his evangelist. He wants to give the people an opportunity for repentance and a way out of judgment. Because judgment is coming. Redemption is that which happens from brokenness to blessing. And the ark of safety is the only way out. Once the punishment happens, once the judgment happens, then the cycle is restored. Man is again in harmony with Yahweh. That's what atonement is. It's the return to at one moment with Yahweh. And then you realize that vehicle of escape, that ark of safety, is where the presence is. The presence of Yahweh entered that boat with Noah. The story of Noah is just the tip of the iceberg. As the scripture unfolds, we see Yahweh's message of redemption, his arcs of safety constantly presented again and again and again and again. Ah. Well, if that's the way it's always been, then what are we to believe? The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of Yahweh because he considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2 and 14 says. The skeptics say, a worldwide flood never happened. And if a worldwide flood never happened, then Noah never existed. And if Noah never existed, the scriptures are all lies. 
Well, how have they arrived at such conclusions? They've arrived at these conclusions through the cynicism of modern science. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith Yahweh has given you, says Romans 12 and 3. So a careful examination of, the, of Noah's Ark story could rock the boat of the modern scientific community. But for the average person, there's only one proof of the story of Noah. And that's the discovery of Noah's Ark itself. Well, where's the boat then if it's true? Contrary to the critics, there does seem to be historical evidence to the story of Noah. In fact, 272 mentions of the story. You can go to the Eridu Genesis, the, the story of the Genesis from the Chaldeans' from point of view, the Sumerians, written back in 2150 B.C. You know what you find in there? The story of a great flood. In the Sumerians' king's list, there's the story of the flood because Cush is in that list as one of the kings and he is the grandson of Noah. And that was written back in 2119 to 2112 BCE. And then there's the instructions of Sherapach in which we hear of the character Noah under the name of of Zidudzura, the one that went into the boat. What a creative name. And the worldwide flood, written in 2100 BCE. Then the Epic of Atrahasis, written in 1635, an old Babylonian Akkadian cuneiform, tells the story of Noah. Then the Epic of Gilgamesh talks about that worldwide flood. Author Constance noted that not only are flood legends found worldwide, but when saving a boat is part of the story and comes to rest on a mountain with the survivors. Listen to what he says, and I quote, The ark grounds locally, with the exception of the biblical account. This is virtually universal. The Admonon Islanders say that Noah landed near a place called Watamei. The people of Sumatra say the ark landed on Mount Morapi. The Fijians on Mount Mabinga. The Greeks either on Mount Parnassus or Mount Orthrus. The Tamaniskis, a Carib tribe in the banks of the Orinoco, on Mount Tapaneco. The Mexicans on Mount Kulahakan. The Yuan, the Australian Aborigines on Mount Dromedary. The Northern Maidu on the southwestern United States on Kitty Peak on the Sacramento in the Sacramento Valley. And it goes on and on. He said this in his book, The Doorway Papers by Arthur Constance. So the stories are constant about these things. There was a worldwide flood. A righteous man was told by his Elohim to build a boat, a large boat, large enough to rescue all the animals and his family. And there would only be a few select survivors. That's the constants in all of these stories. There had even been artifacts dating back to antiquity found where the ark is supposed to be. The water receded steadily from the earth. And at the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down. And on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Genesis 8, 3, and 4. Now, if you notice, this is Aratu, or the region of Ararat. And that mountain range, see those little peaks? Are all along that ridge. There's one mountain called Ararat. wasn't originally called that. Alexander the Great named it Ararat. Originally, that whole area there 
going all the way right here. It was called Aratu, or the region of Ararat, and those are the mountains of Ararat. One of the earliest recorded references to the Ark still being around can be found in the writings of Barossus, the Chaldean priest, in 275 BCE. And he said, It is said there sh is still some part of the ship in Armenia, at the mountain of the Cardians, and that some people carry off pieces of the bitumen, which they take away and use chiefly as amulets for the averting of mischiefs. End of quote. Hieronymus the Egyptian wrote in 30 BCE, and I quote, There is a great mountain in Armenia over the Minyas, called Baris, upon which it is reported that many who fled at the time of the deluge were saved, and that one who carried in the ark came on the shore upon the top of it, and that the remains of the timber were a great white, a great while preserved. This might be the man about whom Moses, the legislator of the Jews, wrote. End of quote. In the writings of Flavius Josephus, the Jewish historian, in the book of the Antiquity of the Jews, book 1, chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, written in 50 CE, and, he's, and I quote, However, the Armeni Armenians call this place the place of descent, for the ark being saved in that place is remains are shown there by the inhabitants to this day, end of quote. John Chrysostom, the Archbishop of Constantinople, said in a sermon in 390 CE, and I quote, let us therefore ask them, have you heard of the flood of that universal destruction? That was not just a threat, was it? Did it not really come to pass? Was not this mighty work carried out? Do not the mountains of Armenia testify to this where the ark rested? And are not the remains of the ark preserved there to this day for our admonition? End of quote. The Christian historian Philostagius wrote in 425 CE and he said, and I quote, As for the Euphrates River, it appears to take its rise in Armenia, where the mountains of Ararat are. The mountains are still called by that name by the Armenians. It is where, according to scripture, the ark came to rest, and they say that considerable rem remnants of its wood and nails are still preserved there. End of quote. Church History, Book 3. But is there any sightings today? Well, in the summer of 1916, during the thaw, Lieutenant Rakachovsky of the Russian Imperial Air Force, he was a pilot, he saw something in the Ararat region. And then he took a picture of it with a box camera. Could this be the Ark? Well, it so impressed Tsar Nicholas II that he dispatched an army of soldiers and explorers to find the Ark but he was in the process of losing his empire, and by the time of the expedition, by the time it came back, he and his family were dead, and anything to do with the religion was being removed and destroyed. Unfortunately, the records and photographs of that expedition disappeared along those with the mission. But what about, what about that pilot that started everything? Rumor has it that he was captured and the documents fell into the hands of the communist leader, Leon Trotsky. And the messenger was silenced. He was shot to death. In the 1990s, explorer Edward Crawford found ancient rock carvings in the Ararat region in Proto-Sumerian script. It was called the Ahura Covenant inscription. And in that inscription, it says this, El's sacrificial covenant of the sky bright bow, the rainbow, go forth, procreate, and be fruitful. End of quote. Well, let me get this right. There's an ancient message inscribed in stone that directly relates to the story of Noah that aligns with Scripture. Elohim blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. This is the sign of the covenant that I'm making between you and me and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow, that sky bright bow, the, the rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Genesis 9, 1, 12, and 13. You mean to tell me this is not just made with Noah? 
but it's way it's made with Noah and the earth. In that covenant, what does Yahweh say? I will never destroy the world by a worldwide flood. He promised that to Noah, to mankind through Noah. But he didn't just make that promise with Noah. He made it to the very earth. So I don't care what modern politicians say. I don't care what the fools may say. There will never be a worldwide flood. You can flood all of Antarctica and the Arctic. And there'll never be another flood. Yahweh will open up the earth and suck it back up if he has to. All of these findings certainly give us ample reason to return to the mountains of Ararat to further our research. You want to do it? Well, I'm going to anyway. But is this enough to convince the skeptics that the story of Noah is true? And if Noah's ark is on the mountains of Ararat, why hasn't anybody ever found it? Or have they? Noah's flood. Fact or fiction? Noah's flood. Fact or fiction? Is it even possible to cover the earth with water? Do you realize you would have to cover Mount Ararat? Or Mount, Mount Ararat? Mount Everest. You'd have to, you would have to cover it by 20 feet to get a boat over it. And if there was such a flood, wouldn't there be some proof of such an event in the geological record? Because, you know, I'm going to tell you something. If there was a worldwide flood, we can find that written in the geology, the land. I mean, oh, you got to go out to Belton Lake and you can see how the land passes or that way, the Belton Lake is the Leon River, how it cut right through the rock. But you know what, Robert, you, you've seen that. You've seen it probably all the way to Hamilton, hadn't you? Did you, did you ever wonder did that, how did that river get so wide? Because it's pretty much of a trickle now, isn't it? Yeah, there had to be more than just a, that little river cutting that, didn't it? That river had to be big at one time. See, I never ask questions I don't have answers for already. There's something called the hydroplate theory by Dr. Walter Brown. Now, who's Dr. Walter Brown? He's a retired Fulberg colonel and a West Point graduate with a Ph.D. in mechanical engineering and a B.S. from MIT in natural science. He was a National Science Foundation fellow. He has served as chief of science and technology studies at the Air War College, associate professor at the U.S. Air Force Academy. There he's he is professor emeritus and director of Bennett Research Development and Engineering Laboratories. Is that enough reference for you? He says that he's made geological findings that have shaken the core belief concerning the development of the earth of the scientific community. He says a worldwide flood is the only thing that does make sense to the geological record. And I'm going to quote him for the next few minutes. And I quote, We can see on our planet 25 very strange features which can now be systematically explained as a result of a cataclysmic global flood whose waters erupted from the subterranean chambers with an energy release exceeding the explosion of 30 trillion hydrogen bombs. End of quote. All of the springs of the great deep burst. I don't mean burst. I mean burst with tr 30 trillion hydrogen bomb force. Fourth, Genesis 7 and 11. He goes on to say, this explanation shows us just how rapidly major mountains formed. It explains the coal, the oil, the methane deposits, the rapid continental drift, why on the ocean floor there are huge trenches and hundreds of canyons and tens of thousands of volcanoes. It explains the formation of the layer strata and most of the fossils, all the frozen mammoths, the so-called ice ages, and major land canyons, especially the Grand Canyon. 
Surprisingly, it explains the origins of comets and asteroids and meteors. The pre-flood Earth probably had only one very large supercontinent covered with lush vegetation, Pangaea. The pre-flood Earth had a lot of subterranean water, about half of what is now in our oceans. This water was contained in interconnected chambers, forming a thin spherical shell about half a mile thick, perhaps 10 miles below the Earth's surface. Before the flood, the moon's gravity not only lifted the large decoupled and therefore relatively flexible crust at 12 o'clock and at 6 o'clock, it pinched the crust inward at 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock. Both actions pumped the confined subterranean water towards high tide. Twice a day for centuries, tidal pumping also generated immense amounts of heat at the, um, the massive crust compressed the pillars near 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock and stretched stretch those near 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock. These pillars were portions of the sagging crust that touched the chamber floor. You mean they're pillars? Holding up the crust? Uh-huh. Yahweh shakes the earth from its place and makes its pillars tremble, Job 96 says. Increasing pressure in the subterranean water stretched the crust just as the balloon stretches when the pressure inside increases. Failure in the crust began with a microscopic crack, which grew in both directions at about three miles per second. The crack followed the path of the least resistance and circled the globe in about two hours. As the crack raced around the earth, the overlaying rock crust opened up like a rip in a tightly stretched cloth. The subterranean water was under extreme pressure because of the weight of the 10 miles of rock pressing down upon it. And we know exactly when this happened. In the 600th year of Noah's life on the 17th day of the second month. On that day, all the springs of the great deep burst open. Genesis 7 and 11. So the water exploded violently out of the rupture. All along its global encircling rupture, fountains of water jetted supersonically almost 20 miles into the atmosphere. The spray from that enormous fountain produced torrential rains spurting upon the earth and it's as the earth has never experienced before. And the rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. I think most of the time we think of that as a nice little shower. This was a violent rain. Some of the water jetting high above the cold stratosphere frozen into super cooled ice crystals and produced some massive ice dumps burring and suffoc suffocating and instantly freezing many animals including the frozen mammoths of Siberia and Alaska. The high pressure fountains eroded the rocks on both sides of the crack, producing huge volumes of sediment that settled out of this muddy water all over the earth. This sediment trapped and buried plants and animals, forming the fossil record. The erosion widened the rupture. Eventually, the width was so great that the compressed rock beneath the subterranean chamber sprung upward giving birth to mid-oceanic rift that wraps the earth like the seam of a baseball. After the massive, slowly accelerating continental plates reached speeds of about 45 miles per hour, they ran into resistance, compressed and buckled. The portions of the hydroplate that buckled down formed the ocean trenches. Those that buckled upwards formed the mountains. This is why, and this is very important, this is why the major mountain chains are paralleled to the oceanic ridges from which they slid. The hydroplates in sliding away from the oceanic ridges opened up very deep ocean basins into which the floodwaters retreated. On the continents, each bowl-shaped depression or basin was naturally left brimful of water, producing many post-flood lakes. So as these mountains sprung up, 
then these waters would then have settled down at the base of the mountains. So we should be able to find salt water underneath these great mountain ridges. Dr. Brown predicted in 1970 that large pools of seawater would ultimately be found trapped under the mountain ranges on the earth, proving that the mountain ranges on the earth were produced rapidly during the seismic activity of the flood. And this prediction was confirmed by science. A paper in April 27, 2001 issue of Science Magazine announced the discovery of an electrically conducted layer under the Tibetan Plateau. Now, how does that water get electrically charged? Have you ever rubbed a balloon against your skin? What do you form? What does that friction form? Static electricity. It's the same thing that's in your dryer when you pull your sock out from your sweater. Have you ever turned off the lights and pulled out the, the um, laundry out of the dryer? You see all those little sparks flying? That's electricity. So the friction of those rocks going, like when you take flint and rub it against each other, you see that spark, electrified the water that was sliding under the mountains. The article suggested that such high conductivity at depths of about 10 miles could be achieved by a layer of aqueous fluid some hundred kilometers thick containing 10% brine. In other words, salt water. Let me get this right. You're telling me that around the whole Tibetan plateau where Mount Everest is, there's a huge ocean of subterranean salt water? Yes. And there's only one way it got there. The earth swallowed it up. Just like you always said it would. You want more proof? Okay. Remember those rocks that were thrown up by that geyser of water 20 feet up into the air? Where did those go? Whatever goes up must come down. March the 22nd, 1998. About 6.30 p.m., a group of boys were playing ba basketball in Monahans, Texas, and were barely missed by a three-pound meteorite that crashed to the ground 40 feet from where they were playing. The police were called, and 48 hours later, NASA cracked the meteorite open in their labs in Houston. What do you think they found inside that rock? You guessed it, salt water. How'd that get there? When it was thrown up? into the stratosphere by that geyser of water when the seam burst forth. NASA scientists said the meteorite must have come from an asteroid. But Dr. Brown points out that the rock from an asteroid could not contain water, much less salt water. Earth is the only body in the solar system that can sustain liquid water on its surface. This rock could only have come from the Earth. This shows the force with which the subterranean fountains gush forth, launching rocks into orbit. Now these rock fragments are returning to the earth as meteorites, and not only meteorites, as a witness. These rocks contain earth materials, dormant bacteria that spring to life once they're put back into water. And water, but not just any water, salt water. How about three strikes? And science is out. Here's another proof. In the Kola Peninsula, Russian scientists have dug a borehole 7.6 miles deep. They expected to find basalt, the most common volcanic rock. Instead, they found hot salt water flowing through crushed granite. Scientists are mystified and concede that the only the hydroplate theory is the only answer to their problem. But wait a minute. The hydroplate theory says that there was a universal worldwide flood. Just like our scripture says. As scripture says, the springs of the great deep burst open. Genesis 7 and 11. Now that we know where the water of the flood came from, we can see the fingerprint of our great creator in the judgment of the great flood. 
as the mountains rose and land appeared, the water receded and became trapped and was choked off. Every continental basin was left with many post-flood oceans. <laughs> they call them lakes. These were oceans. Over time, the rapid discharge of these oceans carved canyons. For instance, two seas, the Hopi and the Grand Lake, carved out the Grand Canyon in just a few weeks. Psalms 104 says, You covered it with the watery depths as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains, but at your rebuke the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder they took to flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned for them. Psalms 104, 6-8. So these two oceans, these they called them lakes, the Great Lake and the Hopi Lake, began to, this water began to recede into them and form the Grand Canyon. So the funnel region carved by water suddenly released from, great, from Grand Lake is marked by the red circle. This map lies in the southwest corner of the Colorado Plateau. It also formed the mesas, the buttes, and the spires. Perhaps no land feature symbolizes the American Southwest more than the mesas and the buttes and the spires. We have them here in the hill country. A mesa, which means, a, means table in Spanish, is a flat top feature which rises above the surrounding terrain. When you go up to Nolanville Hill, you can see those mesas down across the west there. Its height is less than its width. A butte is similar, except its height is greater than its width. A very slender butte is a spire. The towering walls of these formations are strikingly vertical. And how and when were they formed? Was it over millions of years or in several weeks? Why are buttes and spires concentrated in the basin of Grand Lake? Adjacent buttes contain corresponding horizontal layers showing that they were once co connected. What removed the huge volume of sediment between them? Where did the sediments go? The perimeters of the buttes are not streamlined but scalloped and in in irregular. So horizontally flowing streams did not carve them because rivers and streams do not meander through a flow in circles. A necessary first step is rivers carve buttes. Nor did the wind carve these features because the large sand dunes are missing. So what did happen? I'll tell you what happened. The flood! They formed these buttes. And from this aerial view, you can see how the, this water receded in minutes. And over a few short hours formed all of this. That's what cut that ridge along the Leon River and along the Lampasas River. In fact, every river in Texas shows as it recedes, that water is receding to the Gulf of Mexico, how it cut its way violently through the land. For since the creation of the world, Yahweh's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine natures have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made. So that people are without excuse. Romans 1 and 20. I mean the very terrain of this planet screams out. That there had to be a great creator. We see it in the message of the scriptures. 66 books. We see it in the geological record. Although the evidence is, is tantalizing. I have not proven the story of Noah's, Noah's Ark to be true. Not without doubt. Se skeptics want proof set in stone. And as a matter of fact, science just might be able to supply just that. Could it be that one of the cornerstones of Earth's geological history, the fossil record, supports the idea of a worldwide flood? And does it supply us with even more evidence of supernatural engineering in the history of man? What about the ship at the center of Noah's story? Could it be that science could establish the possibility that this kind of ship could have exist existed and could it, in the scriptural specification, have withstood the pounding that a worldwide flood could have brought? Or will the details of this story actually sink this ancient ship as we continue to research? And what about the hidden message contained in the Genesis account of Noah? Can it provide even more evidence of supernatural engineering? And how can the scriptures shed light on the difficult prom problems facing mankind today. That and many more questions will be answered in the next segment of this sermon. 
Stay tuned for more. That's my message. Isn't Yahweh good? <laughs> and there's a question on the floor. Brother Timothy, what's your question? Well, we'll get into that in the coming days. Amen. Let's all stand. I hope you had a thankful time. Hope this message has provoked you to study so that when you come back next week, you might even have some evidence in your own pocket. Amen. I want us to pray for Gerald's mother because um, that is no uh, casual thing. But isn't it awesome that Yahweh has given these doctors the understanding and the information on how to take uh, one of his vessels and then connect it to a sick heart so that there can be a resurgency of circulation. Yahweh is so good all the time. He works with people that don't even necessarily believe in his, his existence. Scientists. But he works with them, allowing them to find out the mysteries of his universe. <laughs> to prolong life. That is a blessing. Father, I lift up Gerald's mother to you today. First of all, I ask you to calm his spirit. Because every boy is a son of a mother. And every boy is a little boy at the sight of his mother. And Father, we ask you to touch her body, restore her circulation, and give her health. And as she is laying there, and Gerald is with her, make her inquisitive about your presence. She'll see something different in Gerald, a quiet, a quiet solitude. A peace that passes all understanding. Wrapped in love. That is not anything without you. For you are love. As he loves her through you. Cause there to be. A bond. And a peace. But a curiosity. For who you are. Father, bless her. For the sake of your great name and the love of this son. We will give you the honor and the glory as soon as we get the report. We will believe the report of the Lord. And we will noise it abroad. For you said that's our purpose. To proclaim your mighty works and to proclaim your name into all the world. Yahweh. The healer. Healing is the children's bread. And Gerald is your child. Cause him to minister healing. To his mother. And Yeshua's great name. Touch my daughter today. Touch the baby. And those that are sick in our fellowship that are not here today touch them bless others that are traveling and others that are proclaiming your great and mighty works and those that are even enjoying looking at your great marvelous works touch them and bring us all back together in faithfulness to your house that we may in one voice worship you in Yeshua's sweet name, we all say, Amen. The humble will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek Yahweh will praise him. May your hearts live forever. Baruch atah Yahweh, Elecheinu melech haolam, Borei mine mazanon. Baruch atah Yahweh, Elecheinu melech haolam, Borei pri 
ha adama baruka ta yahweh elachenu melech haolam sher hakol niye bidvaro amen which means blessed are you yahweh our elohim king of the universe who creates various kinds of sustenance creator of the fruit of the earth by whose word all things came to be father we thank you we take this food make it nourishing to our bodies return it to its natural nutritional value bless the hands that prepared it and father blessed are you that sustains your people through all manner of good food in yeshua's name amen let's eat good to have the browns lisa and richard back with us today brown well that's also Stephen adele's name i think we've got a brown coalition <laughs> let's eat well thank you all those that are on the internet thank you for listening today and uh, those that uh, generally are with us we miss you and we'll see you uh, as soon as you can get here shalom to you too bye-bye